Hello there and welcome to the Whole Healed Holy Podcast, a place for conversations of the heart, for exploring healing, divinity, and all things sacred. I'm your host, Patricia Russo. I'm a mystic, muse, and spiritual teacher, guiding women into their hearts with a journey of softening. I'm a published poet, a lover of hearts, and a forever student. Welcome, love, to a sacred pause and hopefully a few tingles, and to a reminder that we are all whole, healed, and holy. I'm so happy you are here. Let's slip into today's episode. Living in a constant state of distraction and noise diminishes your intuitive intelligence. Practice being in silence. Soul care is the path toward towards building sanctuary, the sanctuary of love, presence, and leadership within. May the divided consciousness within become unified. This is from a recent share by my guest today. Mara Branscombe is the, a mother, a writer, a yogi, an artist, teacher, mindfulness leader, ceremonialist, and spiritual coach. She is the author of Ritual as Remedy, Embodied Practices for Soul Care, and Sage Huntress Lover Queen, Access Your Power and Creativity Through Sacred fem- uh, Female Archetypes. Mara is passionate about weaving the art of mindfulness, self-care, creativity, mind-body practices, and earth-based rituals into her life and work. And she has been leading community ceremonies since 2000. An adventurous spirit, Mara has sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, trekked across the Himalayas, studied yoga in India, planted trees in in Canada's north, lived off the grid in a remote cabin in the woods, worked as a Waldorf Steiner School teacher, and then found her passion for dance and choreography. All the while, yoga, meditation, mysticism, and ritual have been at the heart of Mara's journey. Her trainings in the Incan shaman lineage and the pagan tradition have greatly inspired her life's work of earth-based, ceremonial, intentional, and heart-centered living and loving. Mara currently lives in Vancouver, Canada with her husband and two daughters, one of which just turned 13. I just learned. What an, what an absolute delight it is to have you here with me today, Mara. Thank you so much for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me. Can we begin by defining a few of the terms in your bio, which I feel so deeply set the foundation of who you are and will be for me this kind of setting the tone for the conversation that I'd like to have today. What is a mystic and what is a shaman? And what is the mm-hmm. pagan tradition? How do each one of these live within you? I'd love to start here if that feels okay. okay. Hey, yes. Let's start with um, the pagan. And um, my lineage is Celtic, um, Scottish, and English. I'm a mix of all of those. And when I was 17, I was initiated into this wonderful group of women the cult sisters of the shields and they were focused on earth-based spirituality um which was um streamed through the pagan wheel of the year and the pagan wheel of the year are spring summer fall winter the solstices the equinoxes and the cross quarter points so they're really um, it's about honoring the seasons and honoring the elements, earth, air, fire, water, and ether. Um, it, it's not necessarily Wicca or Wiccan, but it's more based around really honoring the moon cycles, the seasons of the year, the elements, so that that can be like a guide or a compass, if you will, um, internally and in your environment, your ecosystem. So that has greatly informed my life. So I feel very blessed that I received those teaching at, teachings at such a young age. Um, and, and it was quite cosmic how that just was divine timing really for me. And, and then, you know, a mysticism, a, a mystic. What is a mystic? Who is a mystic? I mean, there are the great mystics of the world. There's Rumi, there's the Hasis, the, you know, the, and I feel that today's mystic really is anyone who's willing 
to be a compassionate human on this planet and to um, really open oneself up to um, a, a greater uh, awareness that goes beyond the mundane of everyday life, that goes into everyday magic, really, if you will. So it's kind of, I feel like the modern day mystic is like the light keepers or, you know, like the work that you do, like sharing that that beauty and love and reminding people that they can also be that. Um, and I think that's really accessible. And then fast track to, or not fast track, slow track, really, to um, what what's a shaman? Well, um, I, and I don't call myself a shaman at all, ever. Um, I would call myself a healer. Uh, I, you know, I'm very interested in healing, the healing arts. Um, a shaman is, you know, traditionally someone who is the healer in the collective, um, who is, you know, performing um, ceremonies and rituals to perhaps heal uh, a member of the community that is sick or to honor um, transitions, changes, births, deaths. Um, and so again, in in our modern world, well, how can we work with this? For me, it's all about ritual. We can work with um, creating special times, even in our daily lives, that become rituals that then enrich our life with um, the sacred, the divine, with love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. I love that you just, like, this is a perfect segue because I want to spend most of our conversation, and this is really how, wh how, why I fell in love with you when I discovered you in the magic portal of Instagram because it's this, <laughs> you know, ritual is really what I want to share, what I want to share space with, um, with you about I'm often asked what the difference between ritual, ceremony, habit, and routine are. Can you share your wisdom about the similarities and the differences as we begin to drop in um, into the topic of ritual? Is and also is ritual spiritual in its in its nature in its essence? You know, I really what I love to unpack here is that it is whatever you want it to be in terms oh, of love that. I, accessibility. And so, you know, the difference I believe between a habit or a routine and a ritual is that one becomes more intentional and conscious. So instead of, um, you know, going to get the coffee and scrolling Instagram, you know, it's, it's, well, can I sit with my coffee in silence I'm going to also light a candle. This is something I do every single morning, whether it's tea or coffee, but I keep the lights dim. I light a candle. I have trained myself to not go to my phone and I begin my morning meditation, um, per, in this way. And so this, this becomes very accessible, but it becomes so rich because these moments, um, will be lost if I am multitasking on my phone and worrying and already stressing about the day or looking at my calendar and how am I all going to get all of this done. So that, that requires, however, me to wake a little earlier to have that time. And then I set myself up for the day that is already rich with ritual, in fact, because I'm listening to my inner self. And I'm sitting in silence and I am receiving through that. So that becomes different. I, I suppose it become is, it has become a habit now, but it's a conscious habit. So I would call it a ritual. Um, so does that, does that make sense to you? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there are some similarities because it does, it becomes habitual. I mean, I, I, those of us that live with this, um, this element of the sacred, um, and, um, and this intention of a ritual, just simply, um, more presence during your morning coffee, for example. Okay. okay. And I think, um, what I wanted, but really what I wanted to touch on before we go into this, because you're really talk about how you can weave ritual into your daily practice and how this can be part of you, of the way that you live. And I, I really just want to name that, 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 that how important that is, that it can be as simple as more presence during your coffee and just lighting a candle and coming into a moment of silence. It doesn't have to include a whole, a whole bunch of tools or a kuchamo or a specific place. Um, and that's really what I love about what you do and how you approach ritual. 
Mm-hmm. Um, are, what are there certain elements of ritual when we when you get into and 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 maybe uh, you you know this question was about everyday rituals. I'm such a nerd with like such a ritual nerd. <laughs> for for me, um, ritual is one of the powerful ways to connect to the sacred, to slow down, to center, and go within. And this is essentially what you just said. Um, with how you start your day um, in a slower way, in a more intentional way, in a more sacred way. But as we kind of come into um, talking about your book and the work that you do, are there certain elements of ritual when we get into like beyond the daily ritual? Mm -hmm. Yes, great question. And I love to unpack this very, um, this essence, which is we have the moon to follow and the moon as a guide and every 29 and a half days it's new moon Mm -hmm. followed 10 to 14 days later by full moon and um that has been a very strong compass for me to guide myself and to guide others as well because the new moon the ritual for the new moon is to honor new beginnings, new cycles. It's like we're planting seeds in the garden, seeds of manifestation, seeds of consciousness, seeds of love. And and that is a more internal energy. So that's the more actually feminine of, of that cycle. And then we get into the full moon energy, which, you know, it's interesting because also it's become very popular now to follow the moon and to do moon rituals, which is wonderful. And again, we don't need anything fancy. It doesn't have to be anything big, but it, it is your awareness. And at full moon, the full moon is full of energy. You know how, how it affects the tides in the ocean and we're 99% water. And of course it's going to affect us. And when we're aware that it is full moon, we're, we're riding the wave as opposed to being pummeled by the wave, right? We're riding the wave. And the full moon can reflect back to us what is out of balance in our life. And how beautiful and powerful is that? Again, to be aware of that. Because when it's full moon, um, you'll see it in your relationships. You'll see it at work. It, it, things may get a little intense, a little wild. Um, you'll see it with your, you know, with your children, your animals. You'll see it in yourself. And again, it is not to blame anything on the moon ever, but it is more to go, okay, hmm, this is coming. I'm feeling this. This is feeling uncomfortable. This is feeling uh, amazing. This is, um, you know, whatever it, the feels are, but you, you name them and you're with them. And so we're not pushing anything down. We're not repressing. We're, we're part of our ecosystem. We're, we're, you know, as humans, we could um, really, really benefit by being even more in touch with our environment. And it's rhythmic. So ritual is also rhythmic. So that we have the moon calendar and we, we can sync up with that. Um, and as women, our cycles, our, our menstrual cycles can also be synced up with the moon. So powerful. Our creation story can be synced up with the moon. And then we also get into seasonal alignment, which is, are you in touch with the seasons and the shift in the seasons? For example, today, and I know this podcast will be aired later, today is the halfway point between winter solstice and spring equinox. It's called embolic. So this is a very special day. Now in our Western society, it's been called the groundhog day, which is really fascinating and interesting because, uh, you know, but if we get back to the roots, embolic in the pagan wheel, it's a Celtic um, tradition. It's called the promise of spring in the belly. It's so beautiful. The yeah. promise of spring in the belly, and we can see it in the buds in the trees. And literally just five days ago, I awoke with the sound of a new bird call. The birds had changed their chirping patterns. Mm -hmm. And my nine-year-old daughter, I noticed it myself, but my nine-year-old came into my room early in the morning and said, Mama, the birds are chirping differently. And it's because of embolic. It's because they, of course, are so tuned in. Mm -hmm. Um. And that was a real sweetness in my heart for my daughter to be able to call that forward. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it really speaks to, um, and I grabbed this from one of your recent posts, the the quote that you shared um, about uh, bringing this quality of stillness and silence into your life. And we live in such a busy culture. It's like, um, and so, and very rarely is, well, it's not easy. And, and most of us are on the hook with it. Like, right. We're chasing, yeah. chasing, chasing, chasing. And it's such a beautiful affirmation of, of what you've done with your daughter, your daughters mm-hmm. to, um, yeah, to, to have her reflect back what I think is one of the benefits of quiet and stillness. It's like you, you can't notice a bird's changing chirp unless there's a quality of si- silence and stillness in that little, mm-hmm. that little girl's world. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is really beautiful. And that's what you speak to in the quote that I shared that, that bringing all of this into your inner world so that you can sync up with the moon, so that you can sync up with the wheel, that you can sync up with the elements and really notice your surroundings with a little bit more depth or a little bit more sensitivity. And that's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, Your first book, uh, Ritual as Remedy, Embodied Practices for Soul Care, is full of practical wisdom. Who did you write this book for? (laughs) <laughs> and, um, I wrote this book. It was a very strong, intuitive flash that I received to write the book and the words, the energy that came through in this intuitive flash was for the collective. Write it for the collective. Beautiful. And so, you know, it was a daunting task to receive this intuitive message and literally so you know, and it doesn't happen all that often. And, um, I'm sure you or, and your audience will have, you know, different, um, ways that they receive their intuition. But this particular flash, I saw myself holding my book again, and I was leaning against my bookshelf and I looked down, I was looking down at this book and I thought, Oh, and I was, it was so strong. It was like lightning through my body. And I thought, Oh, Oh no, now I have to write a book. <laughs> and, but it was, so it, I knew it had to be written because it was more uncomfortable to not write it than to actually learn how to write a book. Um, Ooh. so, so that was very strong. Um, that was a very strong teaching for me. Yeah. I don't have this on my list of questions, but it's coming through really clearly right now to just take a moment to just talk about this idea of intuition. Mm-hmm. Um, where does, what, yeah, how do you define intuition? Is intuition a guiding, it doesn't come from outside of you somewhere or is it some something within? Mm-hmm. Um, and and my goodness, Mara, like, <laughs> I don't know how many times I've had with like lots of clarity, something come to me, like a download or like a very clear message. And I'm like, no, no, anything but that thing. No, no, I didn't. Right. So so I love this. I love this. I can feel that when you get kind of this, yeah, when you get this really clear message to do the thing, to do something, and you know with all your being that it's the thing that you're supposed to do. Where, yeah, where, what is your wisdom around intuition? Where, what is intuition and where does this, where does this come from? I believe it comes from um, being synced up. So a greater reason to sync up with your environment and with your internal ecosystem, spending quiet time enough to be able to, to be comfortable in the silence. So all the more reason to have that daily meditation practice. Very, very important. And I, I feel that the intuition does come from within. And yes, if we're feeling, you know, very uh, comfortable in our environment, um, then we're probably more open to hear it, um, to come through. Um, if we're, like you said, if we're always chasing or pushing, um, we may, we may dim that capacity to be intuitive, in fact. And here's the thing. Um, your intuition doesn't come with a backstory. So this is a really great um, kind of way that I've learned how to work with intuition and how I support others as well. So, you know, when you said, oh, not that thing. Oh, you know, I, I don't want to get that teacher. I don't want to receive that message right now. Um, so 
you know, sometimes, you know, if, if I received that message of like, oh, here's the book and write the book. And then if I said also, um, you know, but I can't do that or, but, oh no, that's too hard. Or, um, I'll never sell enough books. So financially it won't even be, you know, like all of that stuff needs to go to the side. Um, or if it's coming through, that's called a backstory. Um, like, oh, I can't move. I can't leave the relationship because of this, because I, I won't be financially, you know, for a lot of women, I won't be financially stable, you know? So, so that's the backstory part. That's, um, I think we really have to dig into and understand where the narrative comes from um, and how to untangle from the narrative so the intuition can be more crisp and clean and clear. It's not always, but if it's really muddled, it's most likely not your intuition. It's most likely a strategy, a narrative or ego because ego, you know, our ego, which is so important, it's who we are. <laughs> but right. it can really take over and it can really become layered and strategic. Yeah. Um, and so that's the interesting thing I find about studying intuition and just playing with it. Like it's a, it's an experiment. And I, I encourage everyone to just, you know, play with it. And here's one more thing that I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell is that anxiety can take over intuition. Your anxiety is different than intuition. So your worries and your fears and your stressors, that's not your intuition. But it's really good to understand, oh, that's my anxiety talking to me and not to be afraid of it. Just to be really talk, talk to it. It's like one of your parts, right? In the parts work, you know, and then, but then when you get that crisp and clear download and it's a little bit scary, it's maybe a little bit like, oh, not that thing. Well, that's worth, really worth writing down and it's really worth, you know, studying. Yeah, I love this distinction about the clarity that intuition feels really clear. And for me, when I, when I hear my intuition or feel my intuition, it, that's it. It like, that's, that's the clarity. If I could name it, it's like the clarity of truth of a, like a no, yes. like it just drops in and you're, that's why when it drops in, I know that there's a truth and, and I, and I maybe am being guided. And that's why sometimes I'm like, no, <laughs> because I know, but I love this distinction around um, the clarity of intuition, because I think everyone listening can really feel into that. And then the distinction between that versus what it maybe is not around backstory and emotions, which we can also have you know, really great acceptance for um, and, and see and have a conversation with, but it just has a different sense of, it just have, has a different feeling. Um, okay. And I, I can feel that distinction and it's really, really helpful. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's drop into this next part about ritual as remedy. Which rituals, and I'd love to learn which are your favorites or your go-tos or the most effective or powerful ones, um, are best for remedies and what remedies in particular, like how does ritual heal exactly? Well. Mm-hmm. Yes, big question. And, you know, ritual can really uh, bring us into a place of wholeness. I feel our whole life we're either, you know, giving or um, coming up to some new experience or we're in some relationship. And I mean, it's so tender humanity, right? It's so tender. And so, and also the sense of community that we once had is not necessarily so. And the technology has taken over, which can, can, can create really a, a quite an insular, um, doing it alone, um, or my job's never done. Um, so a lot of us are, I feel, are walking around unsatisfied and disconnected. Um, and rightfully so, because look at the conditions in which we are in. So it, it does take quite a training. Um, it does, you know, take discipline to bring us into alignment, which is then when we get into creating ritual and stepping into it, we are activating our divine will to get there. So, and I'll get to the remedy part in a moment, but this is what I feel is really um, powerful is that we're not... Um, becoming a victim in a way to the conditions of our, you know, crazy, busy, stressful life. We can have that crazy, busy, stressful life. And the remedy 
is around what soul care rituals are you doing to create more fulfillment, more satisfaction, so you're not chasing the stress. Um, you, you, you know, you're you're still accomplishing your dreams, your goals, your visions, and you're more steady because you are, you know, activating some of these rituals. So um, the remedy becomes, I believe, the the showing up, the the activation of of our willpower to every morning wake up you know, 20 minutes before you have to get things going so that you can sit in your meditation seat and you can light your candle and you can have your warm drink and you do not go to your phone. Mm -hmm. This is my number one. This is what I I support. This is what I do for myself um, and what I support others in because if you can start your day in silence, in really honoring what I call a sense of neutrality. And now that doesn't sound that magical or, but becoming neutral in the, (laughs) yes, right. Becoming neutral in the center of the body that will allow your intuition to grow because you are, you're touching down on center. You're like that center. And what happens is it becomes to feel so good and comfortable that you desire it. You desire neutrality. It's so beautiful. It, it's so simple. We don't need anything fancy. We don't need any, you know, we just, we, but we have the discipline to do it. And that becomes the remedy. Um, so I would say I like to bookend my days with ritual. Um, and you know, again, it's like, I'm not, um, living in some fantasy world that this is always possible. Um, but it becomes a, it becomes a mindset. That's what's possible. Um, you know, you're, you, even before our podcast, you know, it was, it was very early for me, um, mm-hmm. 6 a.m., and um, my children are sleeping. And yet I still knew that I, you know, well, the night before last night, I set up my meditation seat. Um, right. I set, I set everything up. So that's another thing is that just a little bit of, you know, sweet organization. Mm-hmm that you're you're setting it up the night before perhaps i had my candle here i had my matches i didn't have to go looking for anything it was all here and so all i had to do was sit down and prepare uh, a five minute meditation for myself just to find neutral and then so so it's like that and then the evening the book ending of the days is it's really great okay so it's like what are you doing in the morning that's conscious something and then what are you doing in the evening to bring you into that state where you can say, my work for the day is done. Now my only job is to rest. Well, again, it could be a nice warm bath, a shower. It could be that you're um, doing some a little bit of yoga stretching. You're definitely off the screen half an hour to an hour. I would say an hour before bed, you're off the screen. Um, these are the rituals that I would, you know... Um, you could even write in your journal what you're letting go of so that you do not hanging on to it as you go into your sleep. Mm-hmm. So again, that becomes the remedy is that you're clearing, you're clearing out energy that you may have accumulated um, in your day mm-hmm. so that you can rest and receive. And that's the remedy. Mm-hmm. Oof, Mara, this part about preparing like the, the care, um, the care that we start to take when ritual is part of our lives or ourselves to show up in the easiest way possible. It's really that I think is also such a beautiful thing to learn about yourself and to feel, um, as you provide for yourself. I mean, for me, that's everything. If I, if I have an early morning practice or um, ritual to begin the day and I'm scrambling around when I wake up to prepare for the ritual, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same quality. It doesn't mm-hmm. have the same effect and it doesn't, and it, and it oftentimes doesn't happen, frankly. Yeah. So if I can prepare, I love what you just said, because we can all get a, a real sense of that and I, we can see it, right? Like, even on a day like this, thank you, thank you, thank you. When you, you know, show up at 6 a.m. and have to um, be here beyond the stillness and in the doing um, to to think ahead and plan ahead to prepare that all you have to do is get out of bed and have a seat and everything is ready for you. is so, it's such a really, I think, important part of living this way. 
and of, of setting an intention to incorporate everyday ritual into your life um, mm-hmm. to make it easy because, um, well, yeah, I don't have to say this, I think, to, for myself and probably for everyone listening, if it's not easy um, and we're, we're hoping to accomplish it every day um, or start our day in a certain habitual way, if it's not easy, it oftentimes doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. I think the preparation preparing begin like off I think it feels like the preparing for the morning ritual becomes part of the ritual <laughs> at least it does for me because I have an altar practice as part of my morning ritual and so preparing the altar the night before so that when I get up I don't have to look at it and prepare it it's kind of has become kind of part of the ritual for me mm-hmm. um, I love, yeah and I love that mm-hmm. and I I love okay we've talked really about personal ritual and daily ritual I'd love to um I'd love to just muse with you for a moment like what is it what is collective a collective utilizing ritual for healing like what does that look like when we when we like are and are we returning to this um I'd love to just like in your bio it says that you've been um facilitating community ceremonies for a long time now when ritual lives in community is it instantly amplified? Both I believe so. Yeah. Yes, I believe so. And yeah. I believe that yeah. Yeah. every yeah. time we gather intentionally, yeah. every time we gather intentionally, there is a hearing that happens. Mm-hmm. It is my favorite work. It is my favorite work that um, um, I feel so blessed that I get to do. And, um, you know, when we gather with intention, we're coming... Oh, with all of our stories and our pain and our joy and our acceptance of being um, both seen and seeing. And that is, again, um, really what can be missing in our, in our culture today that used to be very strong. For example, when, um, there was the church, when the, when, you know, the church was the, the place where everyone gathered and people still gather, of course, there, um, at holy sites around the world. Um, and yet there is, you know, this resurgence, I believe, of, of, of ritual and desire to gather in this way. And, when we do collective ritual and, and I can even unpack it in a moment, which is, you know, mm-hmm. how we can make a dinner party intentional, which is very mm-hmm. special as well, is that, you know, we, we can come and we, how I guide people often, um, whether it be around a full moon or a new moon or, um, a seasonal wheel of the year. Um, for example, today, that midway point between, um, winter and spring, it, it, it is that you get to reflect back personally where you are, what season of life you are in. And that's the thing is that in, in that season of life, even today, you know, for everyone listening in this moment, it's like, is there one way of being that you're ready to release that doesn't serve you anymore? Is there one thing that's making you tired, stressed? Um, a little bit disconnected. Can you imagine it just leaving you, Le- opening the window, let it go, let it go out the window. And, and, and when you're in circle and everyone's doing this, it's just this collective like release. And then is, and now you have space in your body, mind and spirit and your heart to invite something new in. And what would that be? Is there, is there something that you're longing for? Connect, uh, longing for a connection, a, a, a sweetness, a, you know, and like the bird song, like that, that sweetness. Can you let that energy in more fully? Um, let's say you're having a dinner party, you know, and you can, and yeah, the toast could be each person going around and sharing three things that they're grateful for. And, and that is, or just even one gratitude, that is so sweet. That's, you know, that has an impact that will be remembered. That has the power to shift one person from a space of feeling disconnected, low, um, like they've given up hope, even, um, what's it all worth anyway? You know, we see that because the state of the world is, there is a lot of grief. There is a lot of pain. And so, 
you know, how can we connect and, and create the web and bring each other up and, and go have each other's back? Yeah, beautiful. I mean, we, and I, as you were speaking about this, I'm thinking also, of course, um, the collective community, all of us, but also the potency of women coming together and men coming together and elders coming together and um, certain indigenous cultures coming together and just the potency of whatever the community is um, because of what you spoke to um, there, everyone is in their own season. So it's like you're set, you're in the season at the moment on the wheel when you can kind of pinpoint the actual day and time in, in physical space but then everyone sitting in that community circle is also in their own season. And so it becomes a really rich texture of community. And then the ritual is, is I feel like is just amplified and made more rich by the texture of, of, of all the spirit that's there, of, the, mm-hmm. of all the season that's there, of all the elements that are there. Um, yeah. Is there a ritual or ceremony story um, that is really powerful or magical that you'd like to share with us? Yes. So that we can Um, hear through you? Yes, I would love to share that. um, I do an annual retreat and uh, last year it was all women and it was, it's in Mexico in this very, very special sacred land, uh, Huichole land, indigenous land that um, the owner has preserved. And, um, you know, there's many developers, for example, there, and she's kept it. Um, this is called the Haramara. Um, it's a, it's a very special resort, um, wellness center that, um, uh, it'll be my 13th year this year, uh, guiding retreat seven days of, um, deep ceremony, yoga, meditation, breath work, um, journaling work, partner work, all of this, just, just, um, incredible there's no um electricity and so you're off the grid and yeah it's very very it it really takes it to the next level of like tuning in to nature and self um, and quiet and and we were having a fire ceremony it was full moon and um it was very very powerful um 36 women powerful group ages 22 to 75 Wow. And yeah, so I, this is part of what I love to do. I turned 50 this year and I think that in part of my, yeah, part of my work really is, um, really, uh, multi-generational and really, um, allowing the elders to speak and to be there and to impart their wisdom simply by being there. Um, and so we were all sit, standing around the fire with our hands, um, palms touching and then our and we reached our arms up towards um the sky and the fire part of the fire ceremony is that we make these bundles um that we give to the fire and we we create bundles out of nature and in these bundles are um you know things that we're releasing and things that we're activating so they're they're you know, the prayer bundles that we offer. So we had offered those, um, to the fire. I had called in sacred space. Um, we had reached our hands up and the energy was so strong and the fire was roaring. And all of a sudden I, I, I literally looked down and I saw us all on the flip side, but it appeared that it was our ancestors. So they, they, they were underneath of us and like really just supporting us and cheering us on for the work that we were doing and celebrating us. And, um, and we were celebrating them. So there was this very dimensional, um, I, you know, I would say I stepped out of time and space for a moment and saw the web of the work that we were doing and how important the work for healing, you know, our future generations and, and healing any, um, you know, residue from ancestral pain from the past. Um, and so that was a moment I'll, I'll never forget. Wow. Yeah. There's something really magical and multidimensional when we evoke the energies of the elements. And especially I want to say, um, in sisterhood. Like there's something really, and then you have the, the native, um, energy of the Mexican land. Like, yeah, I've been 
on retreat in my, I mean, I love Mexico so much for that because you can feel that Mayan really beautiful energy. Like it just comes through so clearly when you're tapped into it. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you one, um, one question before we go into the last three to end this episode, the time is flying and it's not really on my list, but I'm just so curious because you have these two little ones and you mentioned, um, your nine year old, soon to be 10, you said, yes. uh, how she already is so tapped into her environment that she's noticing the, the different sounds of the birds chirping. Are there certain rituals as a mama? Um, that you, you know, that you and your, your, your girls do, or that you would say to listeners that are mamas that are wanting to incorporate mm-hmm. ritual, um, to little ones, um, that are go-tos or that are easy or that they love. Mm-hmm. First of all, it open door policy. So they have been my partners on this journey yeah. of ritual, like, since the beginning and um they have created altars they are crystal collectors they are it, it's just been we are we are we've been a unit um since the beginning and also you know my waldorf teacher training it really comes in uh, because you know i did teach little ones um for some time in my life and i've been trained in it so um but you don't need to you know for anyone listening it's just like never push but invite in and, you know, and, and have it be artistic and have it be free and have it be, um, magical. We would create altars in the forest and on the beach all the time. So, um, that is just, it's just so much a part of them. And, but really some powerful rituals that are being done now in our house is all around. So I've always celebrated solstice and equinox with them. Like, that it's in them. It's definitely in them. Um, <clears throat> part of the work now is me supporting their self-esteem um, through ritual. And we have mantra and affirmation that we say before we go to bed. And I'm going to share one because it's just so sweet and it's, it's in their bones. And now I create new ones for my 13 year old because you know, now she's in another pl- place. But first of all, often children need us to um, rub their feet with lavender oil and soothe their nervous system. So we start with that because you know what happens when you go to bed. Um, and for me anyway, with my kids is they start to tell you all the stuff, all it's pillow talk. It all right. starts to come out. Right? <laughs> so it's like, you got to listen to the pillow talk. You got to make time for it and be present to it. And then we go into, here's one affirmation and you just say it um, enough until all of a sudden they, they just, you feel your nervous system regulate. Like you just feel it. And it, this one is so sweet. It goes like this. I am, it goes like this. I am the light of my soul. I am beautiful. I am bountiful. I am bliss. I am, I am. So, and you repeat that, like, you know, literally I do it every night with them and it, it's like seven times, usually seven, eight times. And then they just search like calm and I feel calm too, because we're, it's just like, again, it's a sweetness. Um, and so that's something that's really been really powerful as a mother to witness and for them to be carried by that mantra. Um, and that affirmation that also it can shift. And then, and then I teach other people how to do that. And so sometimes I'm up in the middle of the night, not sleeping. And then I'll say that, right? That sweet little primary mantra, uh-huh. you know, it could be for babies, but I'm saying it to myself. And that is soothing my nervous system. Mm-hmm. So, oh, sure. Mara, I think this should be your third book, like, like rituals for little, little girls. Oh, like, no. I, I mean, I was that little girl, like I, I, I made a little altars and I like, it's just, there's such a gnosis. There's such a natural curiosity. And I have this seven-year-old niece. I, I always have altars and it's so true what you said. It's not about forcing or about, it's like so about the invitation or just being in your own ritual and allowing them to be curious about it. That's so powerful because 
she just has a natural curiosity about it. And then, I, and I didn't even know. And then one day she came with her suitcase and opened the suitcase immediately and said, I brought this for my, for my altar by my side of the bed. And it's like, mm. it just happened so naturally. And then it, it, I love that you said, and now it's in the bones, it's in their bones. Yeah. And that's it. Um, because it just feels so natural and because it was their choosing um, to be curious about it and playful with it. And I love that. Oh, yes. I feel like there's something more here and I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when we can talk about this, um, this piece in with like a little bit more um, time, because I mm -hmm. think it's so important. These affirmations with little, with little girls, I wish that I had a ritual mm -hmm. like that growing up, right? Yeah. Like how much yeah. of a difference that might've made. Yeah. At the end of every episode, I like to have, I like to ask the same three questions to my guests as a wrap up. And the first one is, which do you relate to the most whole healed or holy and why? Hmm. Whole. I relate most to whole and it is because I feel that is um, an ongoing rhythm within or what I would, would I, I would invite in this ongoing rhythm of wholeness that wholeness becomes our whole becomes center becomes neutral almost and it then informs everything else in life um, it becomes a reflection if it doesn't have an energy of wholeness then perhaps i could release it or perhaps i could um, find the way into whole yeah. Wow. That's a beautiful curiosity that I'm going to chew on for a little bit. So thank you for that. This idea of whole as neutral and um, mm. this quality of of um, coming to neutral as you start every day. Like that's mm. really, really, really beautiful. Mm. Um, the second one is a book that you love or one that you have gifted the most. Mm. Women Who Run With The Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Oh, good. <laughs> I've returned to that one over and over and over again. Isn't it crazy how some of the stories you read, you know, maybe at when the very first time I read it and I can't remember how long ago that was. And then you forget or like certain stories don't. This is really speaking to what you've said already in this interview around the seasons of our lives. Because mm -hmm. then when I pick it up, you know, maybe five years later, even even next week, if I were to pick it up, because women were so ever-changing and flowing and cycling, um, the stories in there have impacted my life in various times in different ways. It's such a beautiful book. Yes, yeah. I would agree with what you said. Absolutely. Um, a quote or mantra that you love or one that guides you? Well, you know, in, in the Ritual is Remedy book, it came so strong, um, which is set the intention, release the outcome. Set the intention, release the outcome. That has really guided me in the last number of years is to connect with the essence, the frequency of the intention, be it love, peace, abundance, joy. And then releasing that final outcome because the universe sometimes has just a little bit of a different path for you. Mm -hmm. And if we stay open to that opportunity, then we will receive the bounty of life. Mm -hmm. I love that. I'd love to make some, just a little bit of time now for you to share the ways in which listeners can find you and connect with you. I know you have a new online course called 40 Days of Awakening Soul Work, mm -hmm. which is live on your website now and has been up since the first of the year. Um, yeah, I'd, can you just tell us a little bit more about what you're doing and what offerings you have now and how listeners can connect with you if they've felt mm -hmm. and about this, about the things that you've shared? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that course is, um, I think a really great way to get into ritual and get into, um, mindfulness practice. It's meditation based. Um, I would say with some moving meditations and then it's, it works with the elements, earth, air, fire, water, and ether. It works with the energy centers in the body. So really again, uh, a lot around, uh, discovering neutral or discovering intuition. 
Um, and so it's all on my website, marabranscombe.com. I, um, I do a lot of new moon and full moon, um, online ceremonies and work, um, pretty much monthly. I love it. And, um, I run international retreats, which is also the work I love and, and the books are there. And, um, I do a lot of private work as well. So I do, um, what I call intuitive counsel, um, and coaching work. Um, which ends up being really quite healing sessions, um, I feel. Hey, beautiful. I will put your website and your Instagram in the show notes. Thank you. So after this episode airs, thank you so much for being here today and for this beautiful conversation and for the wisdom that you're sharing and for your embodiment of this wisdom. It is so important for each one of us to find this neutral slash whole mm-hmm. place in our own stillness um, so that we can access these, the, our intuition and, um, and have these calm nervous systems. I think it's, it's good for each one of us, but also so important for the collective right now. Well, mm-hmm. thank you. Thank you, Mara. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It was a joy to talk with you. And I think that we should meet someday in person. Oh. I would love that. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> Thank you for listening. It means a lot to me that we have shared this moment of deep conversation. If you feel inspired or touched by something in this episode, please leave a comment and or a review. For more in all the ways, please find me at Whole Healed Holy on Instagram and at www.patricia-russo.com on the web. Stay close, please, and know that you are whole, you are healed, and you are holy. I love you. Until next time.